to introduce to you the participants of our today's discussions, those here in the Presidium, and extend our gratitude to all of you for making it here. Our previous session, as you might remember, was very successful, and I do hope that this one will also prove uh, very successful. From left to right, Mr. Ed Morse, who participated in the session last year, but since then uh, he has joined Credit Suisse, uh, where his head of commodities research, Igor Sechin. Uh, I don't think that I should introduce this person. He is very well known in this country and in many countries abroad. Uh, Daniel Jergen for the second year in a row here and Ambassador Richard Jones for the first time here with us and he is Deputy Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. Uh, Mr. Session, if you don't mind, we shall start. Uh, you are steering the process here, so. But uh, if you mind uh, something, we will of course accept it. Okay, let's start. Distinguished participants of the session, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, a big honor to, for me to speak in this audience today. And first and foremost, I would like to extend our gratitude to all of you uh, for participating in the workings of the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum and for the interest uh, displayed towards the topic, uh, which will be made topic of discussion of the session of global energy and future of gas market. Many of you attended the forum last year, and we uh, well remember the discussion that we had uh, then on the uh, outlook of the oil and gas market and our analysis uh, back then uh, has proved to be uh, to the point by and large. Today we are discussing uh, the gas market topic. We see a lot of emotions and often contradictory scenarios of the future of the gas industry. On the one hand, uh, some predict a revolution and fundamental changes in the production and consumption patterns and uh, it means changes in the balance of market supply and demand in pricing mechanisms and price levels. On the other hand, experts uh, have been pointing at inertia, the existing structure of the gas market, and the evolutionary nature of its transformation. So let us, just as we did a year ago, undertake an impartial and unbiased analysis of the situation uh, and try to separate uh, the wheat uh, from the chaff. And let's begin with Russia and some uh, of the facts uh, which are self-evident. Russia is the largest global energy power. Slide one, please. Uh, we can see the developments of the oil and gas production and export volumes as well as the role in oil and gas supply over the 20 years. The end of the 80s was the peak of production in the USSR. In the global production, uh, the USSR share reached 16% in terms of crude and 30% in terms of natural gas. The deep economic downturn at the end of the 80s and early 90s, which affected the energy sector as well, uh, had a big impact on the uh, USSR itself. Today it's uh, virtually unbelievable that back then in the challenging situation we managed to preserve by and large the gas industry and adhere to our international obligations. Since then many things have changed. Models of economic development and uh, the economic activity as well as the country itself. And just in the last decade uh, we uh, managed to regain our positions and build up the export of energy. And that means uh, to increase our input into uh, the building of international stability and here we pull tremendous efforts. Just look at figures. According to various estimates, the total worth uh, of substitution of the gas infrastructure in Russia, let alone the infrastructure of common uh, use, uh, which uh, is considered uh, as an element of the development of the fields, uh, having in mind both the fields and the gas transportation systems, uh, is about 700 to 900 billion dollars, while major planned gas field development projects in the coming five years will require uh, an extra hundred billion dollars. Slide two, please. Now about the role of gas in the global energy. First of all, about things apparent in terms of meeting the global demand in energy. 
Slide three, please. Uh, the data from the slide are well known to uh, all of you, and through the efforts of many of you, first and foremost, Gazprom uh, and international oil and gas companies present here in the audience. Uh, the gas has become the major source of meeting the growing energy demands. In the last two decades, the share of gas in the global energy balance is sustainably growing and is now in excess of 20%. The reason behind such rapid growth are well known. First of all, it's economy uh, uh, because the gas is relatively cheap and it's a green type of fuel uh, going from apparent and to self-evident or perhaps unbelievable I mean the scenarios for the future let us look at the principal shifts in the fundamentals uh, which uh, are underlying the current trends uh, in this session, we are welcoming uh, leading experts in the energy sector, uh, including many of those who are specialists in forecasts. So uh, I will let forecasts to be covered by them and just like uh, them to comment some of the questions later on. In terms of forecasting, especially long term, uh, very often two approaches I use. One is extrapolation of previous trends into the future. That means the preservation of status quo. And the other one is polar. That means uh, extrapolating uh, short-term trends on a long-term basis and sometimes it becomes wishful thinking and the forecast becomes a political instrument rather than a result of objective analysis. Slide four please. The first thing uh, I would like to have answered Renewable and unrenewable energy sources and the changes of their relative roles further on and uh, the significance of the efforts undertaken through the world in terms of bringing into the balance of renewables such as solar energy, wind power, uh, hydropower, which are already meeting a big share of energy demand and alleviating the burden on the environment. Uh, on the other hand, the increase in the use of renewables was only possible through heavy subsidies by the states. The technology are complex and not very viable economically. Uh, the opportunities uh, for dissemination of that technology at, uh, at least require some reserves in terms of generation capacities. In terms of biofuel production and its competition, with uh, arable lands use uh, raises a lot of questions and further on we will be thinking and choosing about uh, which is the most important energy or food security in terms of the one of the most optimistic the so-called green or environmental scenarios available from the uh, uh, IEA, the so-called scenario 450, the growth uh, of the use of renewables may take them to second position by 2030 in the global energy balance. Mr. Jones, uh, right next to me, one of the heads of the IEA, uh, so perhaps uh, he will uh, tell us how viable this type of scenario could be, how the financial downturn uh, impacted on that in various countries in terms of this optimistic position. Secondly, non-renewable uh, there is an uprise of interest towards the nuclear energy and Russia will be heavily participating in that. For instance, we have a program of launching our 27 new energy generation unit. The nuclear energy is a very complex and sensitive issue of domestic policy which requires comprehensive approach, perfect technology, tremendous long-term capital investments, including taking into account the specifics of the fuel cycle and adhering to the strictest environmental requirements. Today in the most countries uh, we are uh, quite far away from the uh, unanimity and financial instability is not very conducive to that. So what we have uh, remaining uh, are traditional fuels, oil, gas and uh, others uh, such as coal. Despite of tremendous efforts to implement and to field the production of the so-called clean uh, coal, uh, it is uh, the heaviest burden onto the environment and it's fraught with both uh, risks to um, human lives and to the economy and we felt it very acutely just uh, recently. The mitigation of those risks will require tremendous capital investments so the expansion of the use of the coal provided the level of technology requires us to heavily elevate the burden on the environment. There are some forecasts which say that uh, all things being equal uh, the uh, 
intensive production of coal uh, might take it up to 26.5% in the global energy balance or even uh, up to 29.1%. Uh, perhaps. Uh, and we would like to receive uh, some verifiable information in this area to have the opportunity to assess the applicability, the economic output, the scaling opportunity, take into account the greenhouses emission uh, aspects. Uh, despite uh, the levels of economic development which are different through the countries, it should not be the major driver in defining our economic priorities in terms of production of energy. Uh, what this leads to is that besides the fact that the uh, forecasts may, might be very contradictory, there is no real alternative to oil and gas. Uh, in the coming decades, they will account for about 50% of the global energy balance. And there isn't a uh, 100% clarity about uh, fuel consumption further on. So what we propose in this area is to put in place the system of monitoring uh, of production and supply of gas, which will be objective and transparent. Slide 5. One of the most uh, actively discussed issues today is what should we expect in the gas market. Slide 6. Uh, the unexpected growth of the production of shale gas in the U.S. in the last two or three years uh, changed the balance of oil and gas supplied in this country and provoked debates about uh, the uh, meeting of energy needs with traditional and non-traditional gas. Many are talking about the revolution in this sense, in terms of gas use. Uh, 